Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Evidence, CSAFE, we want to welcome you to our symposium, Source Code on Trial, uh, with our presenter, Professor Edward Imwinkle Reed, excuse me, and uh, panelists to follow that as well. I will turn it over to Corey for, uh, for introductions. Thanks, Anthony. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, um, Professor Ed M. Wrinkle-Reed, who is the Edward L. Bear Jr. Professor of Law Emeritus at the University of California, Davis. Um, like our panelists to follow, he has a lot of accomplishments. And just to keep this brief, I'm going to just highlight them. In many ways, he is the expert on scientific evidence. Um, an acknowledgement of that is that he was the 2021 recipient of the American Association of Law School Evidence Section's Lifetime Achievement Award. And for good reason, because he is the author of many books and articles on the topic of scientific evidence, including um, the book Scientific Evidence, which was cited in the Daubert decision, uh, the Forensic Science Chapter in the Federal Judicial Center's Reference Manual on Scientific Evidence, as well as being a member of groups like the NIST Expert Group on Fingerprint Examination and the Legal Issues Working Group for the National Commission on the Future of DNA Evidence. Today, he is going to be giving us a group brief overview of um, kind of the current state of affairs of tackling forensic evidence produced by algorithms in the context of criminal trials. I ask that you hold questions for him based on his um, talk until the panelist section where he will be joining, joining as a panelist and, and able to answer any questions you might have. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Ed to go ahead and begin his talk. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2010, Professor Mark Harmon of the University of College London wrote, we are increasingly governed by source code. If we do not recognize that our processes and procedures are gradually becoming source code, we risk a technological tyranny. Now, I'm not here this afternoon to issue any warnings about the imminent arrival of Skynet. I simply have two much more modest objectives in mind. First, I'm going to try to survey the current state of the law with respect to source code. And secondly, to set up the presentations by our other speakers, I'm going to try to highlight the basic issues and arguments that we'll be talking about. Now, as we know, if we peek into the modern forensic laboratory, we're likely to see a lot of computerized automated procedures rather than traditional manual analysis. And those computerized procedures are driven by the source code. They're driven by the blood, the heart of the program, namely the source code itself. Oh, okay. And in the course of surveying the current state of the law with respect to source code, I wanna talk about two fundamentally different issues, admissibility and discovery. The admissibility issue relates to the proponent of the evidence. The question is, what does the proponent of testimony based on a computerized forensic technique have to show? And more specifically, does that foundation need to include any testimony about the source code embedded in that computerized technique? And over the years, we've seen two waves of cases. The first wave involved IRBTs, infrared breath testing devices. And typically, jurisdictions had a statute like the Minnesota statute that I've cited on the screen. And it reads in pertinent part, in a criminal or civil hearing, the results of a breath test when performed by a person who has been fully trained in the use of an infrared or other approved breath testing instrument are admissible in evidence without antecedent expert testimony that an infrared or other approved breath testing instrument provides a trustworthy and reliable measure of the alcohol in the breath. Basically, the scheme is this, the legislature 
enacts a statute saying this administrative agency is empowered to promulgate a list of improved IRBTs. The agency promulgates that list. And if the officer in the case in question uses an instrument on the approved list, there is no need for expert testimony validating the technique at the time of trial. All the judge needs to do is to judicially notice the fact that the device that was used in this case happens to be on that approved list. So during the first wave of cases, the answer was it's valid and it's validated even without expert testimony about the program. Now, the second wave of cases is what we're experiencing now. The wave of cases dealing with probabilistic genotyping software programs designed for the analysis of very small quantities of DNA or complex DNA mixtures. Now, the second wave is distinguishable from the first because during the second wave, most jurisdictions don't have the benefit of statutes like the Minnesota statute. There is no statute saying that if you use this software program, it comes in automatically without any sponsoring validating testimony. But nevertheless, even without the benefit of such statutes, the overwhelming majority of courts have said the testimony comes in based on validation derived from validation studies without any need to present testimony about the accuracy of the source code. So here you do need expert testimony, but not expert testimony about the source code, expert testimony describing the validation studies. Now, there have been dissenting voices. Later on, I'll point to the recent Pickett decision from New Jersey. Pickett ruled that in the context of a Fry hearing, an admissibility hearing based on the traditional general acceptance test, it was going to order disclosure of the source code for the probabilistic genotyping software in case. But nevertheless, notwithstanding decisions like Pickett, the overwhelming majority view has been, yes, you need expert testimony, but not expert testimony about the source code. Now let's look at the second basic issue, discovery. Now the focus shifts from the proponent of the evidence to the opponent. Even if the proponent can introduce testimony without saying a word about the source code, is the opponent entitled to access to the source code, to discover the source code? Number one, to challenge the admissibility, to challenge its validity, or number two, to attack the weight of the testimony. And that second factor is important. In 2008 in Crane versus Kentucky, the Supreme Court ruled that the defense has a constitutional right to attack the weight of otherwise admissible prosecution evidence. Now, once again, there are two waves of case law. First wave of case law, again, dealt with IRBTs. And the overwhelming majority view, again, was that there was no right to access. And the rationales were twofold. One was the motion is directed to the government, but under the contract, the government has neither actual nor constructive custody of the source code. The second rationale relied on in a few cases was trade secret. That source code is trade secret and the trade secret privilege justifies denying access. Now there were contrary decisions. Remember I said that Pickett was a New Jersey decision. The leading case to the contrary with respect to IRBTs was the Chun case decided in 2008. Again, a New Jersey decision. And New Jersey happens to have some of the most liberal criminal discovery rules in the United States. So given Chun, once again, we encounter a split of authority. Now we shift to the second wave of cases, probabilistic genotyping software cases. Here, most of the courts have once again denied discovery. At last count, I think 20 different courts have denied requests by the defense for discovery. And now the primary rationale has been the trade secret rationale. But again, there is a split of authority. And in fact, the most recent cases allow discovery. 
One of the recent cases is the one I've already mentioned, Pickett decided in early February of this year, and he even more recently decided in late February of this year, a memorandum order by Judge Donetta Ambrose in the Ellis case, which specifically cites to the Pickett decision as precedent for allowing discovery of the source code. Now I've given you a brief overview of the status quo. What I wanna do now is to try to set the stage for the other speakers by identifying the major issues that are going to be debated. First, the admissibility issue. And what it really boils down to is this. Is proof of the accuracy of the source code the only acceptable way to validate a forensic technique or at least an essential part of the foundation? When the proponent undertakes to establish this, they have to worry about two different federal rules, 901B9 and 702C. 901B9 is an authentication rule, but it deals specifically in B9 with proof that a process or system produces an accurate result. 702C, which is in part a codification in 2000 of the Daubert decision, refers to proof that the expert has relied on reliable procedures and methods. The point we have to see though, is that typically there isn't a single way, there isn't only one way of satisfying those statutes. For example, authentication. I have to authenticate a letter. I can do that by the acknowledgement of the purported author, by the testimony of a recipient witness who saw it signed, or in most jurisdictions by the testimony of a forensic question document examiner. Multiple acceptable ways. The same thing is true with 702C. Suppose I've got a toxic tort case and I'm trying to establish a general causation hypothesis. I could use epidemiological evidence, but in many courts, that's not the only way of doing it. Many courts accept a combination, for example, of in vitro and in vivo studies. So the issue is the essential question, does the methodology do what the expert claims that it does? Do we have to establish the accuracy of the source code to prove that these programs do what they claim they do? Now, if we get down to brass tacks, what is the claim with respect to these programs? Truth of the matter is there are three different claims. One claim with respect to the identification of the number of contributors, a second claim with respect to their genetic profiles, and a third claim with respect to the, li the likelihood ratio. Now let's talk about those first two claims, number of contributors and their profiles. I can validate those claims without relying on source code as a matter of logic because I can conduct ground truth validation studies and I know what the profile is. I know what the number of contributors are. I can establish those claims without resorting to any testimony about source code. The key issue is the third claim, the accuracy of the likelihood ratio. Now in Pickett, the court points out that when they did the audit of FST, they discovered in that audit, the audit of the source code, that some loci had been removed. And Pickett makes an important point. There's a fundamental distinction between the IRBT problem and the probabilistic genotyping problem. If I'm talking about the IRBT problem, I've got this sample. I can take a blood draw from the same individual, calculate the amount of alcohol in the blood draw, and then compare that to the estimated breath alcohol concentration that's been generated by the RIBT. When we're talking about the likelihood ratio. I don't have a physical sample that's the essential equivalent. And so the question is, can you authenticate? Can you validate the claim about the likelihood ratio without getting access to the source code? And that's the question that I hope 
the discussion later among the panelists will focus on, because I think that is the crucial issue with respect to validation. Now, at this point, to set up the discussion with respect to discovery, let's take a look at the multi-factor test that ordinarily governs discovery. In some cases, you'll have a statute or court rule that dictates this sort of document is discoverable. But in most cases, the judge is applying a multi-factor balancing test in order to figure out whether it ought to be disclosed to the other side. And there are three factors that inform that test. The first factor, the potential utility of discovery. Here, the probability of discovering errors in the software. Now, I have a good friend who is a scientific evidence expert and specifically a computer evidence expert in the United Kingdom. And he and some of his colleagues a few weeks ago issued recommendations on the probity of computer evidence. And what they point out is this. They're talking about Horizon, a computer program that generated all sorts of problems, including some wrongful convictions in the United Kingdom. A program such as Horizon will contain tens of millions of lines of code, Trulial 170,000. Programming is a human task and programmers make mistakes. An error rate in writing software of 10 errors per thousand is considered good. One error per thousand lines is rarely, if ever, achieved. As the Pickett Court says three times in the opinion, these sorts of errors are ubiquitous. I've cited to you the 2017 California Law Review article that lists second, six sources of error in addition to accidental errors, the thing that my friend is talking about in the 2021 article. Now, you're almost always going to find errors, at least technical errors in source code. The issue is, are they important? Pickett says FST and STR mix are cautionary tales because after the audits in those cases, they discovered glitches, defects that in fact discovered the outcome that affected the likelihood ratio that was quoted to the jury. And if that's the case, if there are potentially significant defects in the source code, factor one seems to cut in favor of allowing discovery. But now we come to factor two, which I submit is going to prove to be the real decisive battleground. The existence of alternative methods of obtaining reasonably equivalent information about the existence of some defects. Now, in some cases, it's relatively clear. You either need a new validation study or grant access to source code. Those are cases in which the fact situation before the court exceeds the parameters of the validation study. Now, let's talk about this expression, the parameters of the validation study. PCAS had a wonderful short summary of the then available validation studies in its 2016 report. And it said, if you look at these studies, there are three keys to the reliable application of probabilistic genome typing software. Number one, you need a sample of a certain minimum size. Number two, no more than three contributors. And number three, the minor contributor must account for at least 20% of the sample. That was the point of the Gazantner case in 2019. In Gazantner, to begin with, arguably they had a sample under minimum size. It was plausible that there were four contributors and the minor contributors seemed to account for only 7% of the sample. So Gazantner says, we're not going to let this in unless there's a new validation study or unless you grant source code access. And this concept of validity as applied is driving the research. I can find, for example, in 2020, a new article co-authored by Dr. Perlin involving 10 unknown contributors going a long way since the 2016 summary that PCAST gave us. That deals with situations where it's clear the fact situation exceeds the parameters of the validation studies. 
But the more troublesome issue, the issue we're now dealing with is this. Even if the fact situation appears to be within the parameters of the validation studies, there may be latent defects in the source code that could affect the likelihood ratio calculation. At first blush, you'd say, well, that has to cut in favor of discovery. But I'd refer you to the brief filed by the prosecution asking for reconsideration and picket. And they basically make two points. Number one, in many of these cases, the error in the source code was at least tiffed off, not by an audit of the source code, but rather by validation testing. That was the case with FST. And Pickett says that was also the case with respect to STR mix. And secondly, the prosecution makes the point in its brief, the Commission for International Society of Forensic Genetics takes the position, quote, the DNA Commission does not consider examination of source code to be a useful fact-finding measure in a legal setting. A rigorous validation study should be sufficient which is basically the same position taken by SWIGTAM. If I had to predict, this will be the real battleground in the cases. This is the issue that will shape the future of the case law. The question of, can we treat validation studies as a reasonable substitute for an audit of the source code? Will those validation studies in most cases lead to the discovery of any major defects that could impact the likelihood ratio. Now, the final factor is the factor of countervailing considerations. Assume arguendo that factors number one and number two cut in favor of disclosure. The countervailing consideration is this information, in many cases, constitutes protected trade secret. And the holder of a trade secret in most jurisdictions has a privilege a qualified privilege to refuse to disclose such information in court. Now, I know Professor Wexler has made a wonderful argument to the effect that it's in a posit, it's inappropriate to apply trade secret protection in the criminal context, but you don't have to adopt her position. You don't have to go that far. The question is, even if we do apply trade secret protection on the criminal side, should it protect source codes? Should it deny source code discovery if the other two factors cut in favor of disclosure? Now, the formal rule in the civil cases is that when information is protected by the trade secret privilege, the holder, the owner has the right to withhold. It. But again, as I said before, it's a qualified, it's a conditional privilege. And the real rule, the real rule in the civil cases is this. Whenever trade secret information is highly relevant, it is discoverable subject to an appropriate protective order. And if that's the case on the civil side, it seems to be all the more reason to take that approach on the criminal side. What's happening on the civil side? You're ordering disclosure to the attorney for your economic competitor or to the expert for your economic competitor. In a criminal case, the accused is not the economic competitor of the company that has the trade secret privilege. So if it's acceptable to have discovery on the civil side, when it's highly relevant, subject to a protective order, it seems to stand to reason that ought to be the approach taken on the criminal side. But again, that assumes that you've resolved factor number two in favor of disclosure. And again, if I had to predict, I would forecast that that is going to be the issue that will shape the future of the case law on discovery of source code. And having said that, I just hope that I've set the stage for the other speakers. I'd be the first to admit that I'm a rank amateur when it comes to computer science. I'm really looking forward to their comments on these issues. And at this point, I'd like to yield the stage floor and the screen to the other speakers. And thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you so much, Professor Michael, for that wonderful overview. 
As a reminder, if you have questions for Professor Ed about any of the things that he just talked about, go ahead and start putting them in the Q&A and we will address them in the next session. Um, so in this next session, we have three other panelists joining Professor Ed. I do want to note that we had been anticipating um, Kelly Kulik, a Deputy Public Defender for the Santa Clara County, to be joining us, but she unfortunately had a family emergency and won't be able to. So as alluded to by Professor Ed, right now um, in society, technology and algorithmic approaches are kind of expanding above and beyond just DNA um, and breathalyzers. And so the issues that he presented and the problems are becoming more emergent to resolve. Today, we are joined by three other panelists in addition to Professor Ed, who offer a range of views on how to handle the access to source code during criminal trials. I'm going to give a very brief introduction of both, and then I will be asking them each to um, introduce their, over, their relationship and experience with source code issues and um, criminal trials in a one to two minute um, introduction. So one of our first panelists is Dr. Mark Perlin. He's the chief scientist and executive of Cybergenics, the maker of True Allele, which is a probabilistic genotyping system. He developed True Allele 20 years ago, and he's testified for both prosecution and defense about um, reliable unbiased computer DNA evidence in a range of trials, including state, federal, and military. He holds doctoral degrees in mathematics from the City University of New York, computer science from Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University, as well as a medical degree in university from the University of Chicago. Our next speaker is Professor, Professor Rebecca Wexler, who is an assistant professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley. She's also the faculty co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology and a graduate of Yale Law School. Her work has focused on the intersection of evidence law, criminal procedure, privacy, and intellectual property protections surrounding these kind of issues of new data-driven and algorithmic criminal justice technologies. Professor Rick Simmons is a professor at the University, I'm sorry, the Ohio State University, Moritz College of Law. His research focuses on the intersection of the Fourth Amendment and new technology. Um, and he's written quite a bit on the topics related to big data and criminal justice systems um, and the use of surveillance devices. He's co-authored and authored a number of books and articles, including the Smart Surveillance, How to Interpret the Fourth Amendment and the 21st Century. I do wanna point out to the panelists, we have a very diverse audience um, ranging from academics from both within and outside the United States, lawyers, forensics examiners, law enforcement, and as I understand it, um, a group of high school students. So I do want to give you those one to two minutes to kind of introduce your views on the topics of source code um, in criminal trials. And why don't we start um, with Professor Simmons, if you don't mind. Uh, no, thank you so much for the introduction and, and thank you for sponsoring this uh, conference and um, uh, all the participants and uh, audience members, thank you for being here. So I'll, I'll be brief uh, in my introductory remarks, love to have a discussion later on. Uh, my focus, uh, as, um, as was explained, is more on the surveillance side. So I've written a lot about um, algorithms when they're used to uh, make bail determinations or sentencing determinations uh, in, uh, in the courtrooms. But the same issues arise there as far as access to source code and uh, possible uh, bias or possible mistakes in those in, in, in that code uh, that could lead to improper decisions. Um, so I'm happy to talk about the, the legal issues uh, when we get to the uh, discussion, uh, the competition, competition clause issues, whether it's constitutional required to turn over this kind of information, um, uh, due process issues, equal protection issues, and so on. Uh, what I've really written a lot about, though, is a topic of procedural justice, which is essentially legitimacy of these, of, of any kind of process in the criminal justice system. Um, and the, the sort of thesis being that we wanna make sure that our uh, processes uh, appear to be fair to people, that they seem to be legitimate to people. And I think that algorithms uh, or machines, uh, black boxes that we use to essentially make determinations in the criminal justice system, uh, they have a legitimacy challenge, uh, mostly because they're new, but also because 
Uh, there's been some um, high profile cases where they have not worked as, as intended or not worked the way people want. And so if we want to encourage the use of these kinds of uh, devices or processes or algorithms, we want to know how to essentially make them more legitimate, more, um, uh, more acceptable, more so that people perceive them to be fair. Um, and I've written about um, what's called algorithmic aversion, uh, where people believe that if there's a machine making a, uh, a decision, it's going to be less valid, less legitimate, less accurate than if a person makes a decision, uh, even if the evidence is to the contrary. Uh, and so I, I've, I've done some independent research also about how to uh, combat that, uh, what people need to know uh, in order to accept these kind of algorithms in court, talking about uh, the persuasive power of, of uh, these kind of processes. And uh, what I've found just briefly is um, people still want to have a human being obviously interpreting this. They don't want to take a, 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 a algorithm or machine for granted. They want to have some human being presenting that, interpreting it uh, as part of the decision-making process. And then secondly, they want some kind of transparency. But the transparency they want is not necessarily the uh, knowing how the source code, knowing how the machine actually works. Uh, they want to know essentially the inputs the machine gets uh, to make sure there's no racial bias coming into that uh, input level. And they want to know, I guess going back to uh, Professor Ed was saying, uh, they want to know um, what the uh, accuracy level is of those uh, of this uh, machine or process. So again, um, uh, that second uh, that second factor of um, there's um, alternative methods of validation studies that can essentially show you that these are valid. Uh, that's I think what what juries need to know uh, in order to trust these kinds of uh, processes. So I'll stop there again. I want to make sure we have time for question and answer, but that's that's where I'm coming from on this issue. And um, Professor Wexler, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Okay, thank you so much for having me and for those wonderful setup, Professor and Winkle Reed, of the issues in this complex series of litigation. My perspective focuses on the very last point that Professor and Winkle Reed brought up, which is the countervailing interest of trade secrets in blocking discovery. I'm going to present three propositions. First, if source code is irrelevant, we shouldn't disclose it. Irrelevant information is not admissible. It's not subject to criminal subpoenas. Second, as Professor M. Winkle Reed said, my perspective is that trade secrets should not be privileged in criminal cases that we can treat trade secret evidence, some source code is a trade secret, not all source code qualifies under the substantive definition of trade secret law, but if it is, we can treat it like other sensitive information that criminal courts are constantly handling with protective orders. So let me ex explain why trade secrets should not be privileged. Trade secrets are a form of intellectual property but they're not like regular old property where you can exclude the entire world from the information you have a right to. They're actually quite limited. Patents is another kind of intellectual property that allows you to exclude the world. But for trade secrets, the balance of policy that the intellectual property law sets says that if other people independently discover the information, or even buy your product on the market and reverse engineer it, we're gonna allow them to use the information. And that's a way of showing you that trade secret law is actually not as much about excluding people as about managing ethics in business relationships. Certain kinds of access to this sensitive information are protected by the law and they allow trade secret holders to have ex post remedies, meaning they can sue you if you steal their stuff. And other kinds of access are not protected by this substantive intellectual property law. It's my view that due process and cross-examination should not be part of the access that is protected under the trade secret law. So that, that's all I can show you in the short two minutes, but I'm eager for questions. Thank you so much. And then Dr. Perlin, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and your thoughts on the topic. 
Uh, yes, um, I have <laughs> days of responses uh, to what's been offered based on um, living this for the last 10 years. Um, uh, basically, science is a search for truth. And that search for truth involves empirical testing. Uh, even in the Gizentainer case that uh, Professor Ed mentioned, uh, that case was reversed last week and the appellate court said that testing and peer review is what's important. Uh, so the search for truth by scientists involves testing, uh, validation studies, and that's the basis of Daubert uh, and how courts decide what's, what's admissible. One of the problems with some of these articles that are written by lawyers and, uh, and as I can't talk about Pickett because I'm involved in it, though I will point out that the, uh, the prosecutors did file a, a motion pointing out that many, if not most of the alleged facts are not true. Uh, and that, that's a problem if you're going to create law based on false non-facts. Uh, there's just so much to talk about, uh, but uh, let me sum it up. Uh, is according to the peer reviewed literature and the manufacturers of these programs, looking at source code does not find errors. Empirical testing does. And while one can try to confuse people and make assertions that sound like a source code review found an error, uh, there are peer reviewed papers by developers of systems who say that's not what happened. And in fact, uh, any problems were found through testing, which then pointed to where corrections could be made by the developers in source code. Uh, since I only have a, a minute, uh, let me point out something else. Trade secrets are important because they protect innovators uh, and they let them put in 10 years of R&D uh, to develop products uh, that uh, can, can do things that you wouldn't have without the innovation. Uh, the two things worth mentioning are first, that the government uh, led methods of mixture interpretation failed. Uh, they just don't work. They're provably unworkable. And it was only uh, incredible innovation, extensive innovation in the private sector that actually solved these problems. Uh, I, I don't have time to address all the false facts about what PCAST has asserted and so on. Uh, there's just not enough time in life to go through all that. Uh, but the reality is you don't need source code to assess the reliability of systems. It's not used by developers. It's not used by the labs. Labs don't have source code. Uh, these systems are tested. I'd like to sort of close by pointing out that ultimately uh, what will happen if you do get rid of innovation and alternative methods and uh, private companies don't have a mechanism for uh, developing products in a way that compensates them and they leave the field, is you're going to end up with what we had 20 years ago. You're going to have government-sponsored solutions that either don't work or don't work well in all cases. And when you have an innocent person, Trulial's helped exonerate uh, 10 innocent men and uh, much of our work now is working with uh, the defense, not with prosecution, is you're going to lose the ability to challenge the mistakes of the state and the limited technology because you're not going to have uh, better technologies that defendants can use uh, to point out that the truth is in the better science because the better science is not going to be commercialized. So. Anyway, lots to say. I'm sure it'll be an interesting discussion. Uh, but my experience is, is that testing is paramount. Source, source code is irrelevant. Uh, and the main reason people ask for source code is to get around the reliability of software as a maneuver in court. Thank you so much, Dr. Perlin. Um, to the uh, attendees who are asking questions, if you would like your question to be directed to a particular particular panelist, let me know. Otherwise, I'll just um, do what I'm about to do and make it open. So 
One of the questions for Dr. Perlin is, do you verify and validate Trulil's source code based on software engineer principles? And if so, is this publicly posted? We develop systems using, uh, I'm not answering that question. <laughs> I, what I told you in the beginning is there's a lot that's the current subject of current litigation and argument. Most of the cases mentioned I'm in, I can't even talk about them. Uh, but we do uh, software engineering, of course. Uh, we test our systems. Uh, they, uh, and they're, uh, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. And just for the non lawyers in the audience, it's very typical to not be able to elaborate on um, current lawsuits. So to the extent right. that I'm able to. Right. To As I've that, said, I was yeah. expecting that almost all the questions directed at me would be questions that I can't answer. So hopefully there's something I can. Yeah, I think there will be. I was wondering um, if I could ask a question. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I know so little <laughs> about computer science, doctor, that I, I've been dying to ask you this question. Let's suppose you were a defense consultant. You had hired by a defense team and they had questions about a probabilistic genotyping software program. And it was a situation in which the fact situation didn't exceed the parameters of the validation studies. Three contributors, 20%, fine. But I nevertheless had a suspicion that there might be some errors that affected the calculation of the likelihood ratio. If you were the defense consultant in that sort of case, how would you go about designing a validation study to figure out whether there were potential defects that would impact the likelihood ratio calculation? Well, um, I do consult uh, in defense cases and I do review papers mm -hmm. uh, where I'm asked to assess software and I, I am provided uh, with source code and I don't use it, I don't look at it. Mm -hmm. I, I would compile the program. I would do several things. I would test the program which I assume I would be given, we provide true allele in any criminal case mm -hmm. uh, to, to either side, that's freely available for testing. Um, and I would test the program and something else that we do is we run other software. So for example, if uh, the state has run software and it's run into issues, uh, if we have access to that software, we would test it, we often don't. We would run our own software uh, which has been extensively validated to see where there are sources of potential disagreement. And we also run other software. Uh, there's about a half dozen open source mm -hmm. programs. And what we do is we test and then we compare. That's what we actually do. We don't look at source code, even if it's available. Okay. Oh, I also wanted to add something else. At Cybergenetics, we make truly available under protective orders. Uh, we sometimes urge and advise lawyers to do that. They don't always take our advice, uh, but we have made it available. And all that happens is that the goalposts keep moving. It's like, okay, you can <laughs> test the software. Um, no, we don't want to test it. In fact, we've offered testing in basically every case. And the response is, we don't want to test it. All right, you can have source code uh, under a protective order. And then uh, usually the opposition will uh, propose a particular protective order in some motion. We'll say, fine, that's reasonable. Our lawyers are fine with that. And then the goalposts keep moving and nobody ever reaches an agreement. So it really strikes one as a ruse. It's not something where, oh, now we have the source code and we'll find a problem. There's no defect they're looking for. They haven't tested it. And if you speak with people who develop software, the concept that you wouldn't test software or know what you were looking for. I don't know what you would find in source code if you don't know what you're looking for. If you're not willing to do empirical testing, and so far no defendant has ever been willing to do empirical testing of software, uh, I, these aren't scientific objections. These are legal maneuvers. Great, I'm wondering if I could also jump in for, for a moment before we open up to the broader audience. Sure. I just wanted to respond to the point and say, I agree completely with Dr. Perlin that trade secrets 
are important. What happens with trade secret law is that if there is a misappropriation, trade secret law gives the trade secret holder the right to sue and get a remedy from the theft of that valuable information. And that is how the law incentivizes innovation for all the good reasons Dr. Perlin suggested. The law also sometimes in narrow circumstances allows trade secret holders to prevent other people from doing things that they haven't yet done. We call it an injunction. And that requires certain showing. It requires a showing that there is actual or threatened misappropriation, that somebody's gonna try to steal your stuff. There is an extreme remedy in some jurisdictions, although it's frowned on, which is called an inevitable disclosure injunction. And that's where you can actually stop somebody on the basis of trade secret law from doing something when there is no threatened and no actual misappropriation. What happens when developers assert trade secret rights to withhold relevant evidence from criminal defendants or indeed from the prosecutor on a subpoena, they are trying to claim if the basis is trade secrets, a right akin to an inevitable disclosure injunction, which is more of a remedy than the substantive trade secret law already gives you. So just to synthesize all of that, of course, there might be circumstances where bad faith counsel is trying to get access to information that's not really relevant and they're doing it for bad faith reasons. That's a kind of thing that's a risk for subpoena practice all the time that criminal courts have to deal with all the time. They have to deal with it in civil cases too. So the courts know how to handle that risk and they evaluate under the same standard we should apply to source code, whether a subpoena is being issued in good faith. When a judge decides that on a case by case basis, then the issue becomes, is there a countervailing reason if it is a good faith subpoena to nonetheless deny it? And trade secret law doesn't have to provide that. It can't, it, there is no reason for trade secret law to provide that because if in some extreme scenario, the information is disclosed to counsel under a protective order, and that individual then steals it and sets up a competing business, the original trade secret holder would have a right to sue them. And on top of it, they might be subject to sanctions and professional discipline. So more protection than the substantive trade secret law allows in business negotiations. I just wanted to share those additional thoughts. Thank you, Professor okay. Wexler. But I'd have to add to that, that in practice, if somebody has your source code electronically, it's done. I mean, it can be sold, it can be distributed, you don't know where it's going, and it's gone, which is why protective orders in normal civil cases, like uh, patents and so on, um, permit inspection, uh, but not electronic ownership uh, or taking of materials that can be easily um, shared, spread, copied, or sold. So many of the arguments for a trade secret privilege that have made headway in the courts have presumed that there is a risk of business harm or financial harm from a future follow-on disclosure of the information to a business competitor. But that analysis assumes that attorneys who are officers of the court, who are sworn under oath, who have no history of violating court orders, who are subject to loss of their professional license if they violate a court order, are not to be trusted. And yet these are attorneys who handle sensitive information under protective orders and court orders all the time. From people's yet, personal diaries, financial yeah, yeah. records, that's not the issue. Thank you both. I'm going to go ahead and switch. No, no, but I'm, I'm sorry. I get another I mean, question, sorry, Dr. Becky, Perlman, that, I think that's, that's, I'm you're sorry. going to come that's back to you. That's not the issue. 
you keep so changing Simmons, the subject. Dr. Perlin, if you'd like, I'm sure, I think you're gonna be very popular and people have other questions for you. Professor Simmons, um, we had a question related to the Fourth Amendment. So it's a little bit different of an issue, but suppose that a defendant had a um, argument that the Fourth Amendment had been violated based on some technology, for instance, that the FBI was using. How could the defendant appropriately assert that defense without having access to um, the algorithm that was used, for example, to indicate their computer held something sensitive or in violation of the law? That's a great question. So the, the question with the Fourth Amendment is primarily whether or not there was probable cause to get the warrant or uh, meet one of the exceptions to the warrant requirement. And that's going to be um, well, it's up to in a number of situations. First, can be a judge can decide that, not a jury. So a judge will decide if there's probable cause. A judge has to be convinced that whatever process was used was sufficient to uh, to meet that standard of probable cause. Um, I would I would actually argue that I think that the again the uh, validation studies uh, would be sufficient to convince a judge of that. That is, um, this algorithm in a fourth amendment context, this algorithm has correctly predicted a um, uh, you know the, the, a crime or criminal activity in this number of cases out of the total, if it's 50%, 60%, that's certainly gonna be probable cause. I guess I could um, analogize it to, to drug dogs. Um, so uh, people, uh, police use uh, drug dogs to sniff and if they detect the narcotics, they'll, they'll alert. And um, essentially those are gonna be sufficient to give uh, a warrant to the police if it can prove that drug dog uh, correctly alerts a certain percentage of the time. Usually it's around 70, 80% in drug dog case. Uh, but there's no need to sort of explain, um, you know, to explain the actual inner workings of the drug dog itself. The, the judge doesn't examine that dog specifically. The judge just simply looks at uh, the, the track record essentially of, of that dog. So uh, you would do that, I think, also in these in these cases of algorithms. You see are they, how accurate are they? Um, we do that certainly for bail. Uh, we have lots and lots of data, millions of points of data actually uh, with bail algorithms to show how, like, how accurate they are in predicting a risk of flight or, or future dangerousness. And so you could do the same, same with this without having to delve into the actual details of how the, how the process actually works. Okay, thank you. And so this might be a related question, but it could also be more general. Suppose you had two software systems and both are validated, um, but essentially that you run into um, competing decisions. So I believe that this was written in the context of DNA. One, one software says that it, um, the person is likely to have been the same as the DNA specimen, and the other one says it's not. Is this a situation where source code, so source code um, needs to be reviewed to resolve the issue? And I'll open it up to any panelist who has a view on it. Well, one point to remember about the federal rules of evidence, and specifically Rule 702, is that the advisory committee note to the 2000 amendment specifically says, specifically contemplates the situation when competing sides methodologies will both pass muster under 702 and Daubert. It's not the judge's choice to decide which one is correct, assuming both of them pass the minimal standard of validation. Now, in that situation, both of them can go before the jury, and then the question isn't the admissibility issue, it's the question of discovery, as in the, the, the case where you're saying, I need discovery for cross-exam, it's not going to keep the other side's evidence out. And at least to date, the courts have not said that you needed to make that disclosure. The practicality though is that if you were the side relying on such an estimate, you would be saying, we're willing to disclose our source code. We're willing to give our validation studies and make them public as True Allele has done. And that's the reason you ought to prefer our result rather than their result. And that sort of situation, you've got a real incentive to come forward with the disclosure to give the jury a principal basis for choosing the result generated by your methodology rather than the result championed by the other methodology. The, the, there's a real pressure on you to come forward with disclosure, even if it's not constitutionally 
or statutorily required. I, I totally agree with that, but I would also that, that you you have an incentive to do so to be more persuasive, so the jury accepts your your um, process instead of the opponent's process. But I also would I guess agree with Dr. Perlin on this. I, I don't see why it should be required, at least under the rules of evidence. Um, I, I am actually concerned. Uh, Dr. Perlin says it's it's irrelevant, um, and again, I'm not I'm not not an expert to know how relevant it might be, but I do worry about essentially Rule 403 for those non-lawyers. That's essentially the unfair prejudice versus the uh, probative value. That is, if the source code is revealed and if we find that there are, you know, 10 errors in the source code, um, as Professor Minkle Reed said earlier, that, that could be misrepresented to a jury. Uh, if a jury hears there's a certain number of errors in the source code and they think, oh, that means the source code can't be trusted. Uh, it's hard for them to actually evaluate what that actually means. So I, I'd be very reluctant to say that revealing the source code and being able to cross-examine the source code would do much of anything to convince a jury. Uh, for them to understand what the source could actually mean, what, what these errors might mean and so on. I think that'd be beyond what most jurors could understand. Again, once we get, once we convince a judge that the method is reliable and it passes the, the Daubert test, it gets to be admitted. And then there's plenty of other ways you would convince a jury uh, that you should, they should believe uh, your, um, uh, your process rather than the opponent's process. They, certainly the, uh, the person presenting can be cross-examined. They can explain in, in layperson's terms how this actually works. You'll have, again, the validation studies that We'll, we'll explain how, how accurate it is. Um, and, and I think those are things that a jury can look at that'll be persuasive. I worry the source code would, uh, you know, at best be irrelevant, but, but at worst might mislead them uh, as far as um, not understanding what the source code actually, how it actually works and what errors actually mean. Yeah, and I'd go back to the point that Rick made about the probable cause standard. In so many cases, when it comes to admissibility, reliable expert testimony, authentication, Fourth Amendment, all the law does is prescribe a standard, but it doesn't say that there's one and only way of satisfying that standard. And the issue that's posed here is whether we ought to treat this context differently and say, you have to present evidence of source code in order to pass the validation standard. 702 doesn't say that, 901 doesn't say that, the question is, as a matter of scientific logic, is that the result? And that, that's one of the reasons this is such a special context. I want to just add to that what Professor Amwinkle just said, that the law isn't giving you a particular mandate on admitting this material. So too, there's not generally a particular mandate on the defendant on the strategy that they choose to use to argue their case. And so as long as information that the defendant is seeking to subpoena meets the relevance threshold, it's fair game. You don't generally get somebody outside the defense team able to tell the defendant how to strategize or how to prove their version of the case. Thank you. Okay. So Sorry. I'm, oh, Professor Simmons, go ahead. I just wanna, yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with that. But again, that goes back to the trade secrets issue, which I know we've already had some discussion over, but. Uh, there, there are plenty of times where defense wants to present a certain strategy, but some kind of privilege, whether it's, you know, it could be, uh, you know, psychotherapist privilege or uh, some other kind of privilege prevents them from going down that path. So uh, that's the balancing test, again, that uh, Professor Minkler was talking about before. Uh, the defense doesn't have, uh, you know, can't pursue any strategy they want. They are bound by privileges which exist for, for, for good reason, and we have to sort of decide how to balance that. Right, thank you. So I'm getting a number of questions that I suspect um, are coming from the diversity of the audience. So about um, how source code is provided in criminal cases and to give context, you know, coming from um, a STEM field, we would always provide that electronically either GitHub or you would just um, provide your R code, for example, and statistics. Um, do any of the lawyers or Dr. Berlin too want to talk about how source code would be provided, um, if ever, in paper format. So I guess the first question would be to just kind of try to summarize these down. Is it the case that source code is provided in hard paper format in criminal trials, in your experience? Just relying on what I've read in part in the Pickett case, what was contemplated there was that there would be a standalone computer offered where you could view 
the source code. But the original proposal for the protective order there was that you couldn't connect it to any electronic device that could retain it. You could only take notes within paper and you couldn't share it with any other experts. And, and, and again, one of the things that's unique about this area is the truth of the matter is it relates to more than one scientific discipline. I mean, look at the fantastic background that Dr. Perlin has, degrees in so many diverse areas. In part, this is math. In part, it's biology. And this is a situation in which an expert viewing this code might say, I have a suspicion about this part of the source code, but I'd really like to talk to an expert in this discipline to figure out whether my suspicion is correct. So if the source code is important and you really want to scrutinize it, given the diversity of relevant scientific disciplines, when you say you can only take notes in paper and handwritten, you can't share it with experts in other field, it can be a real impediment. But then again, that assumes that the contents of the source code are really meaningful and important. But once you come to that conclusion, then it becomes down to brass tacks. What limitations are you going to apply when you're making access available? Standalone computers, restrictions on notes, restrictions on recording, all of those practical problems, you know, rear their ugly head. Thank you. Um, a next and related question is, so we've been talking about kind of in some sense, simpler softwares, but uh, artificial intelligence is a growing popularity. Um, it's being used for a variety of different kind of problems, including forensic evidence. Um, if you're thinking about how to evaluate an artificial intelligence type of software, um, one, it's a competitive field. And so obviously you would have the trade secret kind of worry, the economic concern, but two, it's really difficult to evaluate that without the source code and the data that was used to kind of train it. Um, what are any of the panelists' thoughts on how to address that problem in the context of a criminal trial? I can't answer that, but I can simply <laughs> magnify the importance of the issue. You mentioned at the outset that I had contributed to the reference manual on scientific evidence. The latest edition is the third edition, 2011. Well, the Federal Judicial Center is considering issuing a fourth edition. So a few weeks ago, they held another national conference, not this conference, but another one. And there was a really fascinating presentation by computer scientists. And a computer scientist from Arizona State made the point that in the past, the source code has been written by humans, but there's a distinct possibility that in the future, what will happen is that the human programmer will write a very general level of code and then using AI, that code will be trained to develop the source code. So this whole landscape could change in the near future, shifting from human-generated source code to AI-generated source code. And if anything, the questions that were asked about how do you train it, what was the database, will be even more important. So I don't know the answer to those technical questions, but I can tell you that the magnitude, the importance of that question, those things are likely to increase in the foreseeable future if that ASU computer scientist is correct. And so do uh, Sorry, just, my, just to, 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 your question or the question was, how do you evaluate AI? And I guess the, my, my follow-up question is, what are you trying to evaluate about that? Yeah, you're trying to evaluate, again, the accuracy of its decisions. You're trying to evaluate whether or not it has some kind of bias in decision-making based on the, you know, the ways making a decision or the inputs that it gets. And so to me, that's the real question we're trying to grapple with here is when you say, how do you evaluate these systems? What do you need to know about them in order to move forward? You just need to know they're reliable. You just need to know, do you need to know how accurate they are? Do you need to know if they are perpetuating pre-existing biases in the criminal justice system? Uh, I think those are questions that, you know, we have to sort of hone that question a little bit more before we can give those answers. Yeah, and I think that that is an interesting point and kind of leads into, do, do you feel that the current kind of legal procedural 
structure that is in place for doubt validation and evaluation of expert witness testimony is sufficient for these kind of AI-based tools? Or do you think that there need to be changes? I do think that the courts are becoming more astute. For example, in the context of facial recognition technology informed by AI, they really are taking a more discerning look at the composition of the data sets in the validation studies. One of the issues that's arisen has been bias against Afro-Americans bias against women, bias against Native Americans. And they've had the good sense to go to the validation studies and say, give us the composition of your validation study. Did you really train this AI program on a set that was representative? And at, at least in that respect, we're becoming more comfortable critiquing AI systems, but I suspect that it's just the tip of the iceberg. And I would be the first to confess, I know so little about AI that I think I'm just looking at one small slice of the issues that are gonna surface in the near future, especially if we're getting source code written by AI techniques rather than by humans. I mean, one thing that the current legal structure does always provide for is cross-examination of these experts. Again, none of these there's no information coming in straight from a computer, right? There's always somebody, as far as I can imagine, who is there to present it, to say, um, here's, you know, here's my explanation of how this works. Here is, uh, again, the validation studies. Here's what we put into the uh, algorithm. Here is the result that we got. And that person can be cross-examined uh, extensively. And I think that's, I guess I have not heard yet anything that makes me think that is insufficient, that we have to change that system uh, because that's really what a jury, as far as a jury understanding what it is, that's what a jury needs to know. I think that's what a judge needs to know in order to decide whether or not it should be reliable enough to come into, into, into um, the courtroom. So. And I think Rick's right about that. In all the cases that I've seen, the AI generated result has never standing alone come in as substantive evidence. Typically, the pattern is it's cited as one of the bases of the opinion under Federal Rule of Evidence 703. And under 703, the basis of the opinion doesn't even have to be independently admissible by virtue of the second sentence of the rule. We haven't, and I think we're a long way away in the fingerprint context and the facial recognition context from anyone offering a standalone opinion generated by an AI technique as substantive evidence in the case. I could add zooming way out that as law generally addresses new technologies, there are various points of intervention. And so there's the possibility of legislative standards and some debates have been happening in the US Congress about imposing additional standards on algorithmic systems in criminal legal cases. And then there's the admissibility structure that Professor Edmund Gulreed said, followed by discovery and disclosure and cross-examination. And so just the question about how law should respond to new technologies often seems to me to presume that there's an either or option that somehow if we bulked up the standards in the beginning, that that would obviate the need for cross-examination on the back end. But that's not the case. All of these points of regulation exist in concert. A question from uh, someone who has not spent much time in a, a federal courtroom and, and something I'm curious about as well. Uh, two part question goes to Dr. Perlin. Um, if you're in a federal appellate courtroom, does the judge or jury get to decide whether or not you're able to present software as possible evidence? And then if it is presented, does the judge ever ask to demonstrate the program in front of the courtroom? I haven't seen that. Uh, usually we present the results of validation studies uh, at admissibility hearing. And then when we're in a courtroom uh, and we're educating the jury about how a method works, uh, we describe what the computer is doing uh, by uh, teaching the jury with pictures and words uh, and going through what the process is. 
I also have a comment about a, an earlier question about what happens if different expert programs arrive at different results. I don't think that would actually be source code. I mean, it's possible, it's be very rare, but the real point would be that you might have slightly different models and the validation studies would show that uh, these different softwares on certain cases would get uh, different results, all of which is amenable to testing, which is what we do in science and in court as well. Uh, it's science is about testing. It's something that we can actually determine what our programs doing on different data. I mean, it has occurred in history that two experts in a legal battle have disagreed, and yet uh, one wasn't, you know, disregarded or executed. <laughs> they were, uh, they were, uh, uh, they were just. Uh, there was a disagreement about uh, what they were talking about, and that's why they were triers of fact. You know, there are a couple of comments today about the difficulty of presenting this sort of dense technology and dense scientific concepts to the jury. I just thought I'd mention one innovation that's growing in popularity. The problem in the past has been they've tried to arbiter the battle of the experts by a court appointed expert under Federal 706. But if the jury learns that the expert is court appointed, the fear is that the jury will almost automatically defer to the court appointed expert without really carefully considering the perspectives of the competing experts. What some judges are doing now, inspired by Judge Schwartzer's article in the first edition of the reference manual, is they're presenting the jury with primers by experts, primers that don't want to ask the expert to reach the merits of the issue before the court, but rather to teach the jury or the judge in a bench trial enough about the fundamentals in that scientific discipline to more intelligently evaluate the competing claims by the litigants. And so, for example, if I were in a case and I were a judge facing competing results generated by probabilistic genotyping programs, and one of the programs was not true allele, I'd love to be able to appoint Dr. Curlin to give the jury and me a primer on this field so I could make a more intelligent decision as to whom to believe. And that is one technique growing in popularity that's enhancing the ability of judges and juries to wade into these dense technological areas. I think Dr. Curlin would be a perfect primer expert in such a case. Uh, Ed, I'd like to comment on your concern about accuracy and likelihood ratios. There have been a lot of validation studies that have been done uh, that show that when you have good statistical models that use all the data, which is what you see in the mm -hmm. more recent computer programs, is that there are very predictable uh, scientific relationships that you see. Uh, you can pretty much predict match statistics based on quantity uh, of a contributor to a mixture, both inclusionary and exclusionary. There are other statistical tests when you look at ensembles of maybe 100 match statistics. Uh, the work that's repeatedly cited uh, from uh, Balding and Steele from 2014 that says there's no uh, correct likelihood ratio is based on older methods uh, that Balding himself has moved on from uh, back almost 10 years ago, that made very little use of the data, discarded much of the data, mm -hmm. and doesn't resemble uh, what true allele or star mix do. Uh, so there are all these amazing claims that go around that just kept keep getting repeated. And yet when people write articles, publish papers, and show that there are predictable laws, uh, that likelihood ratios are concordant between systems uh, and that they are predictable. Uh, what happens is that we don't see them mentioned by opposition attorneys. They just keep getting repeated, even though they're not true. Now, now you had talked earlier about using other probabilistic genomotypic cipher to sort of double check the result yielded by one. 
In your experience, when that's done today in 2021 with the five or so programs that you deem reliable, are all the likelihood ratios really within the same ballpark? Is that your typical outcome? Yes, it depends on the sophistication of the program. Uh, it's what you'd expect. If you're using primitive methods from 15 or 20 years ago, you'll get one range of match statistics. When you start moving into uh, dropout programs and other methods that discard much of the data but make some other uh, accommodations, you'll start seeing another range of math statistics. And when you use uh, software, uh, whether commercial or open source, that is now accounting for uh, the mixture data, its variation, what's happening uh, in the experiment, uh, in the test tube, and so on, you start seeing a pretty good concordance uh, between these different programs. Thank you. Um, Dr. Perlin, there's a question for you about the um, asking for further explanation about the difference between testing and source code. Um, the question is, in my experience, you need the source code to test different modular parts of the algorithm. So in order to test specific methods, not the whole integrated software or algorithm, you need to have the source code. Would you attribute that type of discovery to testing instead of source code examination? Um, or how would you address a concern like that? Well, I would say typically when you buy a car, you expect the car to work. And if uh, the answer you give is, I, nobody can buy a car without the engineering diagrams and scrutinizing them, that wouldn't have much um, purchase in the real world because we know from common sense, not just being scientists, that you test systems. Uh, we have all kinds of requests. We'd like uh, some people want to rebuild our system. That's kind of like saying, I can't trust a Honda unless I'm able to assemble it in my garage. Uh, in the real world, uh, it, these systems are tested. If you have a question about how are, as Ed has said, how are the likelihood ratios calculated? Are they reliable? Are they reproducible? What are the range of, of, um, of samples on which they've been tested? How can I know uh, what I'm getting? What scientists do, what all the scientific standards suggest and what crime labs do without source code and what manufacturer testing does without looking at source code is we test on huge amounts of data. So if someone had a question about a module uh, for any technology, computer or otherwise, uh, what a scientist would do would be to develop a set of data and ask the question. You don't need to take things apart. That's not what happens in the rest of the world. I mean, uh, iPhones are used as evidence against defendants all the time far more than software programs for DNA. Uh, and yet the issue of iPhones and other devices is do they work? Are they, do you test them? Uh, there isn't a, a requirement to uh, provide uh, trade secrets or, or other types of information that are not answering the question. The question is, does it work? If you have a focused question, on how does it work on certain circumstances. That's why uh, so many labs and manufacturers spend so much time doing validation studies. I mean, the first grant I had for Truallele 20 years ago was testing it from an NIJ grant on, on data. That's what scientists do. So a lot of the, these questions are interesting, but they're not what scientists do in assessing reliability. And I think the law often respects that. And certainly most of the decisions involving admissibility and source code respect that as well. Thank you. And this is both related to your comments and also to, I think, previous questions. So in the instance where you have two software systems that have come to different outcomes, and you might say that's a battle of the experts, um, but let's say that they're both correct in the sense that they don't have any um, bugs. One thing on the science side that we might do is look at which of the a solid model assumptions are more plausible. And sometimes those model assumptions kind of the nitty gritty things are encoded in the source code. Um, so in that context, they're kind of a two part question. One, who should decide which of the model assumptions are more plausible? And then two, um, do you need the source code to kind of work that out? And that's well, that's a great question. So one of the confusions that are introduced sometimes with source code is that um, lawyers may freely exchange the words 
software, executable software, source code, and algorithm. And you see in motions or arguments that either the lawyers are confused or maybe they're intentionally trying to confuse somebody. I mean, so this is a general audience, so that's worth talking about. There are algorithms, there are methods, there can be a set of statistical equations. Uh, they can be procedures that are written down in algorithmic form. Those are generally disclosed. They're published uh, with Trulial. We, uh, when we filed patents 20 years ago, if you get a patent, you have to disclose your method. We were publishing our, our methods on stutter and mixtures 25, 20 years ago. We continue to publish. So the methods themselves tend to be published. You can read the statistical equations or the, the algorithms. That's disclosed. People know what the differences in the models are. The source code is what engineers that specification into a working piece of software. Version after version, lots of testing. That's what, what can take years or decades of refinement. And that's what we're talking about. And usually looking at it doesn't tell you much about the algorithm or how it works. It's just code, it's, a, it's how you build it. If you wanna know the algorithm, read the algorithm. If you wanna know how it works, you go to the third step, which is source code is compiled into a testable, executable software program that can then be run by a crime laboratory or by an expert or by someone who has access to software. And defects, problems, issues, limitations of models are found by testing the software. If you have a set of data, it could be casework data, uh, it could be validation data, it could be uh, public validation data. You can run different programs on the same data and ask, how are they working? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What are their capabilities? And ultimately, the validation studies measure the information that's found in the DNA, the likelihood ratio, or if you're technical, the logarithm of the likelihood ratio. And that's where the comparisons are made. Uh, I'll also say that many of the cases that uh, I'm involved in and others are involved in, where there's a battle of uh, one program says this and one program says something else, have to do with the conditions under which a program is run, which may be different. Uh, there may be different parameters that are put into programs and those programs will produce different results if there are different parameters. And they also um, have to do with what a crime lab is willing to report. You may have a crime lab that's producing a match statistic of 10,000, but the crime lab, for whatever reason, has a protocol where they call anything under a million inconclusive. Mm -hmm. And so now you're looking at results that appear to be different, but they're actually concordant. I mean, I won't name it, but there was a case I was involved in where a lab called a result inconclusive. We ran truly ill on it. It was clearly a huge exclusion. And ultimately when the laboratory retested it, they were able to get beyond their cutoff level and develop an exclusionary value as well by changing their criterion for reporting. So that's a whole new dimension of how people run the program and how labs report their results from running programs. You can have two labs running the same program, getting the same results that give different reports. One might call it inconclusive, another might report an exclusion. This could be important to a defendant. An inconclusive result can be argued by a prosecutor to sound like someone's guilty. Oh, you can't, ex you have to watch it to believe it. Um, but, oh, you can't exclude this, it's inconclusive. There's no, meaning there's no information. That means you can't exclude somebody. Oh, logically, if you can't exclude them, they must be included. If they're in the DNA and they're included, they must be guilty. Uh, that's not, doesn't make any sense, but you hear it in hearings and at trials quite a bit. So the, uh, and sometimes you'll see lawyers fighting against an inconclusive, uh, or, or rather they want the inconclusive because they don't want the more definite result. But that is often just what a lab chooses to report. It's not what the software is doing at all. 
Okay, and then in the interest of time, I'm going to lump together a few questions that all seem to be directed at Dr. Perlin and about the same thing. Um, just asking you to share your views and experiences on whether you feel that um, defense attorneys or um, defense experts are truly trying to steal um, your algorithms and your output when they ask for source code and if it's ever happened, either to you or to others that you're aware of. I think the concept that you offer a, a defense at team and their experts an opportunity to test software and they refuse. They have the opportunity to run other software and they refuse to, to run any software. They actually refuse to produce a match statistic. I mean, Ed's concerned about, can you, is it accurate or not? If it doesn't even exist because the team is not running any software on it, then it's hard to know. Uh, so you have to ask, why is somebody asking for um, a trade secret when they can run the software and produce an answer and argue about the results? You give them the software, they just don't run it. So it sounds like you're saying the motivation is suspect, but um, just to answer their question, have you has it happened to you or anyone you're aware of? hasn't happened to us because whenever we provide source code under a protective order or offer it, uh, nobody takes it. They keep arguing that they need something else while continuing to never test the software that they have access to. So I don't know. Okay, it, seems like, it seems like it's a game. It doesn't seem like there's any purpose for it. Thank you so much and thank you to you all. I, I think Anthony has a few words. I wanna thank each of the panelists for um, participating today. today. I wish we had longer. You guys have so many interesting thoughts and experiences and I know from the audience that they could keep going too. Um, thank you so much. Anthony, I'll turn the table over to you. I will echo Corey's thoughts and, and thank you all. Uh, Professor M. Winkle-Reed, thank you for your presentation, your insights and your, your education. Thank you all. Um, Professors Wexler Simmons and, and Dr. Perlin for your education on this topic um, and for the, the discussion. This has been exhilarating uh, for me personally and, and I know that our audience has found it uh, in, in the same light. Again, thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you to all of you who have joined us and we hope you have a great day.